So I will actually, um, I'd love to know from you, when did you uh, meet Robert for the first time? And uh, how, you know, what is your memory of that first uh, encounter? So it was totally by chance, because actually when I was studying art history at the Ecole du Louvre, I remember Bernard Blisten, who was my teacher, showed me the film that uh, Robert did on, but he never told about Robert. It was a film he showed us for Tingley and not for Robert. So unfortunately, like a lot of other things for people of my generation, we didn't have access to their work, like conceptual artists from the East or uh, at this time, actually, in, in the 90s, um, I, I never heard about Robert Breer. I was not at all uh, knowing an experimental film. And as an artist, I didn't know him. Just I knew this film of, of uh, Tingley. And um, in 1999, I was in New York because my family is also living there. And I was always doing the same place I love, like Museo del Barrio, Studio Museum, uh, Apex. Uh, I have all my little uh, alternative uh, places. And uh, it mm -hmm. was in Chelsea. And uh, I was always going there. It was a very small space. And in the same room, there was one film. I think it was Recreation. There was some variations. There was a rug, actually the one which is at the Walker now. There was uh, one painting. And I was thinking it was so fresh, so modern. So I look at the press release. I didn't know this guy. And I saw born in 2026, in uh, uh, one, uh, 19, 19, 26. So I was thinking, this is crazy. I never heard about the art, the art of this person. And, um, and then I asked to the woman if I could meet him. And she was very nice. She said, it's easy because he's teaching at Cooper Union. And uh, he was already 74 years old. And uh, I, I went to, and she said, you can meet, them, meet him there. So I went there. And uh, he took me with his car to his house. And I remember at this time we were uh, opening the gallery with Solène and I asked him, I said, could you, would you accept to be the central, uh, pine, the, the central line of the gallery program? Because you, you, you come from the 20th century, you went through all those movements, you never let any movement uh, enclose your work. And for us, it's very important for not being amnesic and and he said, if you think I can quit my job, yes, <laughs> I would love to be part of your gallery. He didn't have a gallery since Bonino died, which was uh, uh, 1974, because Robert uh, didn't try to have another gallery and he was living as a teacher at Cooper Union. So, so I said, so in, you a, in other words, he was asking you if you can sell my works. And I said, I'm not sure I can sell your work because I didn't want to be uh, rude, but people yes. didn't, really need, didn't know him, but more because Solène and I, we, we just started a gallery. We didn't have any money, nobody knew us. So, but he was so happy actually. It was a little, uh, he loves to make some humor. And, and of course he said yes. So we, we start working together. And is that, um... He didn't in any way is past in Paris, is um, uh, past experience living in France. Was that a component of your choice or in any way no, this was part of the not conversation? At not at all. I discovered that after the big, import, uh, very important years he has spent in France. But when I saw his show, I, again, I was totally uh, knowing nothing about him, just his work. And when he when he moved uh, when he when you started working together, uh, did he stay in New York, living in New York, or because his his last year he spent them in Tucson, right? Yeah. Uh, but where was his base when you started working together? Was still New York or he was he... still in Tapan. 
okay. just after the Washington Bridge, you take on your right and you go on the Hudson. He always lived there. Okay. And uh, I think he, he, Robert died in 2011. And I think he moved to Tucson in 2009. So a part of the family of his wife was living in Tucson. This is why they moved there. And it was much cheaper to live there. Of course. But it's sad because at 80 years old, he had to move because he, he was not, uh, he didn't have so much money. Sure. And when was the first show with the gallery? 2001. And can you tell tell me more about the show? What did you show? What was the the reaction of the public? It immediately was very enthusiastic, especially young generation, especially artists. They were they loved his work. So then we discovered the experimental field world, which we didn't know. So we started, Solen and I, to read a lot of books <laughs> to have a little knowledge on experimental film that we didn't have. And we understood it was a very close uh, world. For example, they didn't like so much that he was going inside the gallery because, you know, experimental film, they were doing film unlimited edition sure. and uh, for free. For example, Bobur has all his films. Uh, <laughs> for 40 euros or something like that in the 80s, 70s, it was giving. So yeah, we do. We do, too. We have to. Uh, the Walker has a lot also. Yeah, I know you, you did a yeah. retrospective in 97 yes. of this yeah. film. And uh, and uh, no, no, but I know this. And it was difficult for us to to be accepted by those people. And but Robert said to me, I really uh, I, I want you to explain to the people that I am a filmmaker, I am an artist. It's the same guy. Because before he was always enclosed in one world and not in the other world. And um, but, but in 2000, people were ready to understand that. And they took him like that since the very beginning. All the young generation, all the curators, all the art world really love his work. I told you, especially artists. I think Robert was very successful, actually, but but always uh, in on the on the edge of the margin, you know, like an avant-garde since the beginning. Is when you discover the all different part of his uh, um, artist productions, meaning that. You know, he has been a painter for the big the beginning of his career. Then he moved into experimental filmmaking, and then he moved a, a, away from that and more into sculptural uh, practice. But uh, was he uh, when you met him for the first time? Was he having a, a studio practice? What was the encounter with the works? You encountered the man, but what was the encounter with the works? What did you see the first time you see the works? What did he show you? His studio with everything. His paintings. And it was amazing because I understood how everything was connected since the very beginning. He also loved to, how do you say that in English, bricolé. Mm -hmm. You know, he loves to fix yeah. small things. So he was still fixing his sculpture. After when we were working with him, he was doing new pieces. But when I met him, he was uh, fixing his uh, his old pieces, <laughs> and and I remember I have a wonderful. Maybe I could give you some parts because uh, I never was able to edit it because I'm not good with that. But I I I uh, recorded him for a lot of hours, and he's in studio. And there is one moment where he's explaining me uh, one of his paintings who was on the wall. And uh, like you can see the one that are in Bolzano right now, he was explaining me that in Paris, he understood the abstraction geometric and all the rules and all the, the dogma. And how, for example, he learned everything that he will use in his films later. So, for example, uh, as a Western culture, you go from left, you read from left to right. And it's also like a, a scene, a theatrical scene where people can come from the left and 
Are you still there? Ah, yeah. From like, for example, uh, ele uh, three uh, stage elevator, you you can see how it's using colors to 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 put, for example, the blue give you some distance, the red or orange give you uh, goes to you to the face of the person. So he was learning all those rules that he will use after in his films. Even if the, those modules and the, those colors are moving in the films, this is exactly the same. And, um, and you can also see uh, how the sculpture will also go out from the frame of the painting. So in this studio, the first day I understood that everything was connected. And even if he quit painting in 59, maybe for, reason, for, for other reasons, I don't really know. Also because he loved to try new medium. And of course, cinema was a very virgin uh, new uh, support to experiment new things, but, but everything is totally connected, even his painting. Do you have any specific, looking at this, uh, so those are, these are uh, the paintings in the show in Bolzano. Do you have any specific anecdote about one of those paintings, something that, um, come to your mind as a fun fact you don't have necessarily actually it was not those painting he was talking uh, about uh, the 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 one of, in the left yes uh, we found it with robert when when we met robert we went to see denise rené and it was still in her basement this painting uh, she kept it as as a loan i don't know uh, but it was funny that he rediscovered that painting uh, 70 years later. Um, uh, no, I, 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 then you, you can see all, uh, all the, uh, the movement, for example, uh, the, the one of the right, uh, you can see how it will go. Uh, I think um, uh, three-stage elevator is very close to form phase uh, one. One. Yeah, and, yes. uh, but this is the same, yeah, because from phase one is uh, 52. Can you, mm. it's crazy. It, it was really early. It was in the same time. And he sure. always said that uh, he was so, he loved so much his painting. He was so sad when he was uh, selling one. I think through Denise René, he was selling some paintings. And, uh, one day a Swiss collector bought one of his paintings and he was so sad. So he was trying to remember his painting and um, he, he did uh, all the details, uh, centimeters, square meters by uh, centimeters, square centimeters. And little by little it became a flip book. And from the flip book, he ended to the film. So sure. it's really organic, the relationship between painting, films, and flip books, I think, also. Yes, maybe we can move to. Uh, I'll. I'll. Uh, we can move to the to exactly the the film uh, um, part of his production, because of course, as you said, uh, that for many people, um, that's the part of his life that it's more known or has been the most known for many years. And he's a very iconic figure within the experimental filmmaker's mm -hmm. uh, practice. Uh, but all is, uh, when we did the, the, the retrospective at the Walker, uh, you know, I went through the files of that um, um, exhibition or uh, retros film retrospective, and you can clearly see that what you just said, that the, the films are really the... Um, related to the to the painting and in general to to drawings because that's one thing that uh it would be interesting to talk about is there is how the line and in general you know the idea of uh uh very basic uh line what 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 a line can make uh when it gets activated and so uh can you say a little more about is film uh, production in general, things that you uh, that he told you and how he created them. Um, again, I think he loved 
all the the places where he could experiment it, new things, and film was part of it. And maybe living in Europe at this time, uh, he had this uh, a different uh, idea of film than in America. And for example, he was very much um, uh, fascinated by uh, Emil Cole. Emil Cole was the author of uh, Fantasmagorie, a uh, cartoon from 1910 or 99, I don't remember. And, uh, and it's what you said, it was all about the line. And for him, while well, Disney was was a very bad cartoonist because he connected to 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 the market immediately, but uh, Emil Cole was an inventor, was the guy who really opened the space for new experimentation and and actually uh, the film A Man and His Dog Out for Air that he did in '57 is a homage to uh, Emil Cole and to the line the the. The, 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 the non-interrupted line. But this is also a very uh, specific film. But it's important to say that it was really much, uh, I think, uh, inspired by the European uh, early film, and also Richter and uh, uh, Egeling, all those people, you know, it was very important for him. But um, but then yes, it was to to experiment things. At the same time, there was people like Brackage, or who was also uh, uh, working on on the camera on on the film uh, pellicule uh, itself. He tried many things, and also he loved to create um, because he was always traveling between Europe, France, and America, and he, and he loved also to to create the 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 setup to make his film. Sometimes he was doing it in the kitchen. One day he told me that he, he, he did um, a setting on the top of his bed. Uh, so I think there was a kind of playful uh, uh, attitude because it was a, a free uh, creativity. And maybe this is also why he quit painting because painting was too much... Uh, he, um, too many boundaries. Yes. And uh, especially at Denise René, because Denise René was a huge uh, uh, ego already in this yeah. gallery in terms of uh, paintings. Artists, yeah. Yeah. So, and then little by little, you can see uh, through the films all the things that he will uh, discover. It's very strange because, for example, the form phase, you can see very quick, very easily from the first one to the fourth one, how he achieved and how he... He, he controlled his tool uh, yes. because at the beginning it's very student, like a student. It's a moving painting, but then uh, from phase four is really beautiful and uh, free from everything. And even if it's also paying homage to Montreal to a lot of people, uh, Richter also, uh, but it has his own autonomy also. And little by little, he will uh, recreation. It's more Dada. It's a very strange film, but with the collage, with a, uh, a lot of strange. There is always his works also inside, a lot of his painting that he was afraid to to lose when people uh, will buy it. <laughs> so he was, he was putting them in his films. And, um, and little by little, we will see, uh, like the Fuji. Fuji is, I think it's the stereo stereotype uh, technique. It's a new technique that is trying to, to experiment. But little by little, he will uh, sign his film with this idea of uh, freshness, of uh, day by day. Um, ha he was really doing uh, magic with nothing. There was also his uh, relationship with uh, narrative. For example, um, the film he did, there is one film, he really tried to be non-narrative, the, 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 the less narrative he could. So it was, um, he, he decided to, to put on the floor all his um, papers, all his drawings, and to pick them up in a totally aleatory uh, order, because he also loves aleatory and chance. And, uh, and he was thinking, okay, now it's okay. 
there is no end, no beginning, no end, because the, the film is constructed with a chance. But still, you were saying I had to sign. So there is always an end and a beginning because he wanted to sign the film. So sure. So he was trying many things in different direction, I think. So before we move to the other section of the show, uh, I have a, a couple of questions that are unrelated to his practice, but they are more about his personality, things that might be um, even some some way personal. Um, uh, was Robert, what was the relationship between Robert and his partner? Um, uh, do they have, they, do they wear, um, was she working um, with him or kind of helping him or what was their relationship? So the one I, I met is Kate, it's the second yes. one. Because yes. the first one, uh, I never met her. They divorced uh, many years ago. Uh, so Kate was much younger than him, and with him he had uh, Sally. And they love each other so much, you can't imagine. He met her because I think she was running uh, in the 80s uh, uh, independent uh, film uh, center. So she was, uh, she was an artist at the beginning, and uh, she quit uh, the fact to be an artist quite easy, uh, uh, quickly. But she ran this uh, this space, which was very respected in uh, in New York. I don't remember the name. She could tell you. And I think this is how they met. And he was uh, he admired her. He respected her so much. Uh, but then she had her own uh, agenda. She quit this uh, run uh, artist space, and uh, she wanted to have a kid, and uh, she. So she was not so much involved with, uh, with his art, but they love each other. Uh, Robert was uh, everything but not uh, macho at all. He was, uh, I don't know, he was, uh, he was really very ethic. And um, is, the, is there any um, idea from the family or from you uh, to have a sort of a catalogue raisonné or some kind of archival of his work and his life or, or not yet? We would love. Uh, a lot of people ask me, and this is true, that as we were working together for 12 years, I never thought like that. And But now I think it's important we have to do something like that. This is why we do this restoration work with the film. Sure. And uh, I would like to make, um, with all the discovery of Mark Toscano, he discover so many things chemically, chemically. This is the first time. And um, even we can change some dates of some films. Um, so yes, we, we want to do, uh, I will start with the film, the sculpture, I have the idea that a lot have been destroyed because uh, he didn't really take care of them. Like the one you see in Bolzano, Sylvia can tell you the, the condition of the folioscope and they were in the garage of his neighbor for, for 40 years. And, um, and he told us that some rats were eating his uh, styrofoam sculpture on the top of his roof. So I think a lot, uh, also Denise René, she had a gallery in, uh, in, um, in, in New York in the 70s. And he told me that the cleaning lady uh, put everything in the, in the garbage. So we, we follow his uh, creation through the catalogs. And I, I did all the archives in his uh, studio in Tucson. I went one week. And I took photos of every letter, every press release, every photo. So we, we have some good uh, traces, but still we are missing some pieces with painting and sculpture. And is Kate um, 
um, part of that? What's the? Um, are you doing it? Did you do it together? What was the? The how is the family taking care of this? Okay, she's totally supportive. She, you know, she she she, she admire, respected, and love a man who never has been really recognized when he was living. So she, 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 she I think she, she suffered a lot from that. And I think he would be very happy that now she can live uh, very well because uh, we sold uh, his pieces uh, to big collection and big museum and, and she bought a beautiful flat in Los Angeles, thanks of him. So he would be very happy because he was always scared. And me, one day I was in Tucson and he was uh, driving, he was very tired and he was always sleeping between two lights, traffic lights, so I was very scared. <laughs> and he was explaining me that he gave the house to his first four girls because he had five girls, but he wants to give his art to Kate and Sally. So he said, my first uh, wedding, it was, I gave them a lot because he was coming from a very rich family and he was, uh, he, he used to have a lot of money. So he gave that to the first family, but he always said, please take care of Kate and take care of Sally. And uh, because, uh, and now it's good because they, Kate has a beautiful life thanks to him. Well, Do you remember which, uh, uh, which was the 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 most successful um, sale that you made of his work? Uh, when do you think think when when things started changing for uh, for his market? Even though the market is a very very niche market, we we are very aware of this. But uh, when was the first time that you were kind of happy about the result of what of your work as a dealer with him? I think Bobo have been always very supportive and uh, they had all this film, but they bought with us the first painting. They bought with us the first sculpture. And uh, for him, for Robert, it was really important because it was France. And, and Robert was still alive. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It was in the, the first show. Okay. We sold to the National Collection and we sold to Beaubourg. So it was great. But it was very French, you know? Sure. To, to go abroad, it, was, uh, it took time. And now, for example, there is a huge gallery who would like to have the estate. And uh, so I think, <laughs> not, not because of me, but but I have the feeling that if those people want to have his estate, it means that uh, he is becoming uh, important. Yes. I don't know why, but uh, for a market, for a special market, yes. Well, the galleries that are taking estates are three or four, in, uh, so we can guess who they are. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's, that's very interesting. And, you know, um, so maybe we can go back to the, uh, to the images of the show, and uh, we can touch upon other part of the show and its production. Uh, this in with this picture, we're moving more into sculptural kind of kinetic sculptural element, which you know movement has always been uh, as uh, part of this work, starting from uh, to some extent painting is also uh, referenced the movement, but also of course. Uh, clearly with the films, which is, you know, painting and movement at the beginning or, or drawing and movement. Uh, do you have some um, either knowledge or uh, anecdote about how did he come apart? Uh, how did he come to the idea of starting those uh, mutoscopes or the or the this, uh, other sculptures? Uh, of course, I know his father was uh, um, an engineer, so uh, to some extent he has uh, some kind of in, invention uh, um, um, blood, but um, do you have any um, knowledge about how this came together? First of all, those pieces come from the 60s, but uh, he started to do those folioscopes in, in, in Paris. I, I saw some, some photos uh, in the 50s. 
And for example, he was part of this show, a very historical show, you know, at Essenuis in Belgium in 58 called uh, uh, Movement in Motion or something like that. And he was part with the Zero Group. So I think it was, um, it was in the air. You know, there was the movement at Galerie de Denise René in 55. There was this incredible show in, in, uh, in uh, I think it was in Antwerpen. There was also uh, the continuity in Amsterdam and then in um, Moderna in, in Sweden. So I think all, all those issues of movement and uh, was in the air. But Robert also, again, like he paid homage to Emil Cole. Uh, with his film uh, in 57, uh, A Man and His Dog Out of Air, those uh, folioscopes are kind of homage of the first vocabulary of cinema, you know, with the mutoscope and the uh, tomatrop, how the eye is reconstitute the, the movement uh, of the, and, and the connection between the image. And also, because for example, pot, is a, a flower pot is a little bit different because you can see the movement itself. So it's more a kinetic artwork. Folioscopes are not kinetic. They are not moving by themselves. So I think it's more an image to the inventor of cinema. And there is some poetry because it's abstract. So there is no narrative again. But uh, it's between, and, and I think it's very important because it's really the, the like maybe between the painting and the film, there is a free book, and maybe between the um, the film and the sculpture, there is a folioscope. Sure. So everything is uh, connected. And speaking of movement, we can. Uh, I'd like to spend um, quite a bit of time talking about the uh, floats, which probably are um, is most um known um and to to some extent uh, a very unique kind of production uh, and they are everything between uh art historical uh references to also very cartoonish kind of funny uh objects so uh you said that you encountered the first uh, the first time this was in a show in the artist run space in new york what was your reaction when you saw those small sculptures moving what did you think about it uh, i was amazed i thought it was so lively but also poetic poetical and uh, and again with the background of the film, I saw in the same time some film, some paintings, and 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 I understood everything was done. It seems to be so free and so uh, modern. And when I realized it was very old, I was very um, moved because there is some life. Maybe now, uh, you know, like when I came to Bolzano uh, for the opening. I look at the beginning at the paintings and then I could see I was in the 50s. I can feel. Sure. But then I look around and I was thinking I was in the 22nd century. Yeah. So the, this idea of atemporality, it's very uh, special because it's very rare. Because even good artists uh, are in their century, are in their time. But Robert is uh, always a little bit uh, somewhere else. Like his uh, moving sculpture, we look, you look at them and after you look at them uh, and they are somewhere else, you know? And yeah. uh, he also tests our, our feeling of waiting. We are, they, they include our own body, they include our own scale, they include our own space, they include our own time because uh, they have their own time, but it's always uh, in connection with our time. So they are very uh, human, but also universal. They are, they are everything. But Robert was always saying when he was talking about his uh, sculpture, that 
uh, he was amazed by um, the relationship they would have to the floor. And he always wanted to, again, it's because he's coming from the avant-garde, you know, he didn't like the idea of a pedestal. So he, he liked the idea of uh, uh, finding a dynamic of the floor itself. And uh, his only way to do that was to erase the space between his work and the floor. And uh, we were all part of the same uh, um, maze, or oh, I don't know. But it was also, when you see all those perceptual artists much later, and I think he was much more perceptual. But again, it's also a time, you know, there is Ansaka, there is a there is a, there is Rochenberg, there is a, he was part of uh, Merce Cunningham uh, scenography, he was doing uh, the nine evenings uh, sure. with Billy Cluver. <laughs> I think they were all very, very, very uh, inventive. So, but Robert, uh, yeah, when we see a show like the one you did, you can see uh, how uh, free he is and, and how he can talk now. And I, and it's also very human and very, it's not elitist. It's uh, like uh, when, when we were in Bolzano during this very bad time and so many dead people and, and they seem to be nice with us. I shouldn't speak like that with culture, but no, the the um, the very as a curator, one thing that I really always um, that strikes me of these sculptures is that they are they have so many references. They have meant reference to uh, minimalism. They have reference to pop. They have reference to uh, conceptual art, of course. Uh, they have reference to. Uh, they touch on every single aspect of the. Art, they have, they are surreal. They are surreal. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so they touch on everything that goes basically from avant-garde, from the beginning of the 20th century till today. They touch every aspect of uh, what other artists have been doing in one single object. So mm -hmm. they are a catalyst of every other uh, thinking that other artists have have had in their uh, and maybe. All those artists have had many ideas over time, and he condensed everything in one single object. Uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you about this was uh, here we can see in this image, we can see all di four different shapes. Uh, did he ever tell you uh, how did he arrive to the shapes of the of the floats? You know, what was the driving force with for the formal aspect of it? Because of the 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 movement is somewhat similar to each of them, but then what changes is the is the body of them. How did he arrive to the to the shapes? If he, if you know, if he ever tell tell told you. Uh, first of all, you can see some some of those modules already in his paintings and in his film yes. from the fifties. So I think it was he told us always the little story of. Uh, um, a, a cup, a, a cup that you put like that, you know, upside down on the table. Yeah. But I don't know. Me, I think it was also more uh, fire. Um, also some uh, references to minimal art and to uh, um, that that really escape from minimal art because it moves and this idea of neutrality because he, he didn't like. Uh, Pathos, he didn't like, uh, so he, it, for him it was maybe, because as it's moving, it cannot be anthropomorphic, because otherwise it would be too much um, uh, obvious or anecdotic. Or, so I think he, he liked very much to keep the, um, a very neutral form. Um, but yes, he was always saying at the beginning, and, and Porcupine, for example, uh, because it's also the, the material, it's a mousse or yes. it's, um, style it's a styrofoam. It's a foam, yeah. So you have the feeling that everything is very heavy, like concrete, but everything is very fragile. So yes. he, he preferred to play with those kind of contradiction, uh, 
a very simple form, but who is moving and it's moving in a in an aleatory way. Yeah. And I think this is why, as you said uh, before, he concentrate all those things because maybe it's by chance. Enfin, you see, this is the, the freedom of the piece because it, it's not um, it's not guided by a, a, a computer program. It's not uh, it, it's totally free. So maybe this is how he succeed to be uh, atemporal because sure. it's not connected to anybody and to any time. Yeah. I have one one question about one specific float that uh, we can flip the the page and see uh, that um, uh, here we can see how they move. That's for the public to see how slow they move, but how, so how subtle they are, but how also uh, they cheat on the on the viewer to some extent, because you you turn your back and the show is a different show every time. So that's a mm -hmm. great. And then we can go to the uh, to the next. Uh, and this is a very uh, unique experience, I would say, unique uh, experiment that he made, because here we're talking about a very big um, sculptural element that moves and can you say, um, do you have any history or any um, anecdote about the first time he presented these works and how uh, and how the transition was from the first installation to the following ones over time? So the, the, this piece has been done uh, for the Osaka Pavilion uh, for the uh, universal exhibition in Osaka in 1970. Yeah. And actually, this is Robert who was friend with, because it was sponsored by uh, Pepsi Cola in America. And Robert was uh, living next to one of those presidents of Pepsi Cola. And the guy came to visit him and he said, you are an artist, would you have some friends to, 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 to introduce me to and to propose me for, for this uh, project? And actually, Robert proposed him Billy Cluver because Billy Cluver was a very good friend of him and, as, and he was also a curator. And so they, they did this project and it was uh, amazing. Uh, there was Rosenberg, there was uh, Robert Whitman, there was uh, this Japanese uh, artist, I never remember her name, who did the, the smoke, which is actually steam to... To, to cover the pavilion because they didn't like the pavilion. There is, um, so Robert, he did seven floats, yeah. seven big floats. And uh, those uh, seven floats uh, were exhibited there, but never came back to America because Pepsi Cola was so pissed off of the whole project. They didn't understood. There was also some uh, Tudor, uh, composition, they they threw away everything, they destroy everything, and they didn't want to pay for the transport uh, retour in America. Yeah. So the the seven floats were totally destroyed, and uh, he was very sad. And he was telling us that there is one regret he had was uh, not to to see his float again. And <laughs> so with Solen we said, would you like to redo it? And and we did one by one with him after, with uh, Didier, who is a mechanician. Yes. And, uh, and he was so happy. <laughs> you can't imagine how much. Because also the little story is uh, for the birthday of the Pepsi Cola uh, Pavilion, of, uh, no, of the Osaka Universal Exhibition, a Contemporary Center in Tokyo did again the seventh float but they couldn't keep them because it was a contemporary center and they couldn't return them. So they destroyed them again. So twice it has been, uh, they have been destroyed. So, so um, he was really happy because for him, it was a masterpiece. 
Well, I can definitely, uh, you know how much we have uh, fought for having at least one of them in this show, because uh, I think it's very important to present also the different scale of the of the floats and how uh, they uh, they vary according to, to the, the, the size. And it's also to see a different presence of, you know, a different relationship with the human bodies in the galleries. It's a very different approach, and I think it's very important to have them both. Uh, so b before we close, I think we went uh, uh, way over the time we actually uh, were hoping to. Um, um, we, um, I have one more question for you that it's more of a, another personal question. And what is, if you can say, what is the thing that you missed the most since he passed away? Not having him, what is the one thing that you really, really um, miss of him? You know, I don't because he's, uh, he's uh, part of me now, like my father. And he helped me to stand uh, straight. And um, now, um, and I think he would be in peace because, uh, and uh, yeah, he was always, because uh, he didn't believe at all in God. He was totally atheist and he was always saying that when he was old, he was saying, oh, la, la, there is a, the boss of the garage is calling me, he's calling, <laughs> calling me, uh, he's by the, 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 the guy who is building some, fixing the cars. And um, so sometimes I speak to him the same, um, um, but he's with me. I don't miss because he's with me. That's great. That's great to hear. 